I can see folks coming in. So I think I think we should begin and I will let more folks flow in. So welcome everyone. I hope you're enjoying the content so far. We have had a great panel discussion in the morning and I hope you had a chance to go through the exhibit hall and uh, speak with a few of the partners that we have there, visit a few of the stalls, strengthen your position on your leaderboard. And I think you, and I hope you're engaging in the conference a lot. Feel free to comment in the chat room and our team is there to help you. And now we begin with this session, which is on CHRO imperatives to evolve their talent tech agenda. Chatbots and blockchain are the latest buzzwords in HR technology. And not long ago, it was analytics and big data. Now in this changing tech disruptive business context, how should CHROs build a business case for talent transformation? And with this question in mind, we have the privilege of having with us Yazad Dalal, who's the Senior Director, HCM Transformation Applications, APAC Oracle, um, who's, who's willingly uh, uh, accepted our invitation to be a part of this conference and this, uh, this session specifically, and share his thoughts on this topic. Yazad is responsible for strategy, operations, and overall growth of Oracle's human capital management cloud solutions across the APAC region. Welcome, Yazad. Thank you for joining us for this session. Thank you, Mega. I'm excited to be here, and I'm hoping that we get uh, several hundred attendees to come and listen to our conversation. I think that would be fantastic. It sounds like you're having a great conference so far. Thank you so much, Yazad. Thank you. And uh, folks, like Yazad said, I hope uh, I hope you all keep on coming in and you keep on asking questions as well. So do not forget the Q&A section is there. This is a conversation essentially with Yazad. So I would love to take questions from you. So keep flowing in the questions uh, the moment you have them uh, because we, we are going to take questions as they come in. I have a few prepared from my side, but happy to, happy to contextualize or change them based on the questions that you have for Yazad. With that, Yazad, I think we should jump into this conversation. And my first question to you, Yazad, is you speak with so many HR leaders across, uh, across regions, across industry. In your experience and in your conversations, what would you recommend as one of the best ways for companies to adopt modern HR technology? Thanks, Mega. I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that's important is we have to define the mission first. You know, what are, what are we trying to solve? Is it a modernization initiative? What are, the, what are the goals we have associated with that? Is there a business issue that we're trying to fix, like uh, compliance? Uh, and, and if so, what's the success metric that we want to define for that? <clears throat> Today I was hosting a roundtable discussion. I'm in Manila just now, mm -hmm. and we're talking to Filipino CHROs. And the head of recruitment for a major airline is talking about wanting to modernize the candidate experience. And while we're talking about that, at the same table uh, is the head of organizational design for a major Philippines bank. And she turns to the lady from the airline and she says, why? What are you trying to solve? How do you know it needs to be solved? And she was a very young woman and she's talking to this head of talent acquisition of a major world airline. And she says, I personally won't start a project unless I can clearly define the problem and then clearly define the metric for success in fixing it. So can we start there? And the idea of the round table was to share ideas. So it wasn't taken in the wrong way, but if that's correct, then we need to define what is our mission? What is our goal? What are we trying to solve? Why? And once we know that, then we can draw up a plan to solve it, right? I think technology has a very major role to play in solving. That's what we believe at Oracle. We have a whole business based on that. But it's, it's not technology for technology's sake that is the solution. It can't be where we start. So if the platform enables you to build a solution, first we need to know what we're trying to solve. So we have to decide, do we want to adopt a point solution for my problem? You know, if our problem really is compliance, for instance, if I'm in a big financial institution, compliance is very important. Then what do I focus on? Do I focus on learning first? Is this a training issue? Is it a performance management issue or talent management? Or is the, is the effort that's required to drive change in my organization so significant that actually, if I'm gonna put that effort in to convincing you know, my senior leadership, uh, generally speaking, who are of an older generation, if I'm gonna put all that effort in, then do I just take advantage of that moment and press for full-scale change? So I think four elements to that, you know, one, define the problem, two, define what success looks like, three, create a plan around it, and four, determine in that plan, are we going to take a phased approach and, and adopt 
solutions point by point, or go for full scale change, which requires one large platform that's simply complete. And I think regardless of that decision, launching a technology change in, in any organization has to be done as part of a larger change management program. This is important because I think if we don't do it as part of a larger change management program, it's not going to be adopted. Or if it is, it's not going to be adopted well. So look, the good news is I think there are many elements to start with um, points wise, and you can test it out. If you're in an organization that has multiple business groups or business units, or uh, you're in multiple geographies, then one way to start, we see with a lot of our successful customers, is test it out in a smaller employee population first, drive adoption, get people excited about it, and then roll it out to a larger uh, part of the employee population. Interesting, interesting. So yeah, that, uh, so I think this is a very interesting conversation that you've mentioned, the four point uh, framework, if I can say that you've mentioned. If I were to take a step back and ask you, you know, in this, uh, this context of continuous digital disruptions, uh, and I also mentioned in the beginning how chatbots and blockchain are not a, uh, and some of the newest technologies taking the front seat. And actually, I've, as I say new, they are actually becoming something that's really being used so much. So in this continuously changing digital uh, technological disruptive world, how is the transformation agenda changing in organizations? Look, I think what we believe it's important to recognize that tech disruption is not only continuous, but accelerating. I believe words are very important, right? Transformation agenda makes it sound like we have a choice uh, and, and it makes it sound like we have the luxury of time. I don't think modern companies have either choice or the luxury of time. I think the pace of innovation is so rapid, it has caused a gap not only between technology advancement and the corporate reality, but a gap between our corporate reality and employee expectation. The longer we wait to satisfy the, the rapid changes in employee expectation, the more likely they are to leave or never join us at all which means we'll end up with the wrong people. And then where will we be? And I think, you know, if this sounds alarmist, it's because I, I kind of want to ring an alarm. This is not about if, it's about when. Right. Right, interesting. Very interesting. So, okay, so yeah, that, uh, I think what, what my next question is, and I think, uh, I have started getting questions from the audience as well. So I will hold on to that question. And before I move on to the audience question, I would request you to share insights on how, how do you recommend, and you've, you've touched upon it in the beginning when you talked about the four point system, if you could go into detail there, as to how do you recommend our audience or for those who are listening right now, what would be your recommendations and suggestions on looking to choose and evaluate HR technology because there's a lot in the market. There's, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of noise. How do we declutter that noise? I think it's a good point. There is a lot in the market. I think it's very exciting. 20 years ago, the, the notion of HR technology, first of all, we didn't call it that. We called it HR information systems or we called it the HR module of ERP. So I'm excited about the fact that we refer to it as its own technology grouping. And you're right, there is a lot of noise and clutter around it. Maybe, maybe let's define HR technology first, right? There are some phenomenal startups and single function HR tools coming up. I'm really excited about in the world of assessments, performance. So you look at a company like Pymetrics, for instance, in the psycho assessment uh, space, it's just fantastic stuff. And of course, there's companies around the world, including India, of course, uh, who cover the basics of core HR, the records aspect, pretty well. We believe at Oracle that we're the only company in the world that provides a full service, complete solution from hire to retire. We've covered the basics of every single element of HR, and I think we've done it with a world-class user experience that frankly rivals the apps that we use in our personal technology. <clears throat> I feel good about that. What I tell a lot of companies uh, and CHROs that I speak to is we have to get past this evaluation style that we became used to over the last couple of decades, right? We don't walk into the Samsung store and say, can you, can you demo the S9 for me? I just want to see, <laughs> can I add first name and last name in the contacts? Does it have a dial pad? Hey, do you guys have a browser? How do I get to it? Do you have an app store? 
we don't ask mundane questions. Like we expect that these things have been met. Uh, and so it's frustrating to me sometimes when <clears throat> we talk to companies who say, we'd like you to spend six hours with our technical team to see whether your stuff works. And we have a great deal of confidence to say we have 7,000 customers around the world <laughs> and you're, you've heard of probably a thousand of them. It works. What are you checking for? I think the important thing is if, if the vendor that you're talking to has covered all the basics of every single element of HR and the only prerogative you have is cost, then go for the cheapest vendor that provides basic core HR functionality uh, and use that if that's your priority. I think for us, we've covered all the basics. The challenge for us now is what do we do next? How do we solve the problems that we don't even realize exist in HR yet? We're taking an artificial intelligence approach, an AI approach to everything we develop in our technology platform. So your question should be, and what our audience should be asking when they choose and evaluate HR technology, what they should be looking for is this. At a minimum, make sure that you find a solution that covers the basics. Does it provide a, an employee experience that's minimally acceptable to you personally, right? You're an employee. If you're listening to me talk just now, you're an employee of an organization, most of you. Does it, is it acceptable to you? Uh, use that as the first filter. And if your next priority is cost, like I said, then go for it. If it's uh, affordable, go for it. But I think you wouldn't be listening to this conversation if you weren't interested in what's next and if you weren't interested in what modern HR looks like. And so if your goal is to provide your employees, your goal is to provide your leaders with not an HR software, but an innovation platform that empowers you and your people with something that's easy to use, that's intuitive, that's simply intelligent, that's simply personal, that's simply complete, a platform that allows all of you at work to be more productive and at the same time have a really enjoyable employee experience, then you need to choose not based on what a platform looks like today, mm -hmm. but on whether you believe that that vendor has the best chance of innovating into the future. Have they convinced you? Have they convinced you that in your second or third or fifth year of using that platform, that you will have kept up and your people will have kept up with the rapid pace of change that's happening all around us? And if you believe that, then go with that vendor. Fascinating. I'm sure people have started taking notes here, Yazad. So when you when you talk about uh, HR technology, and you, you did touch about it in the beginning as well, very briefly on the change management aspect. So there is one aspect of evaluating what works best for you within your own priorities from business and from your, uh, you know, from the HR manager and in the employees as well. So you try to balance that out. But one of the very critical factors for success of any technology or initiative for that matter in an organization is change management. Change is something that is that is that that can just uh, set anything up for success or a failure. So what, are, have your, what have been your experiences in your conversations of how organizations are managing, managing change? And what is it something that you would like to share with our audience in terms of uh, managing change successfully? This was the topic of, of my entire day today. Uh, <laughs> so let me think about where to begin. Again, if you're one of the 133 people listening to this conversation, I think generally speaking, you are open to change. The challenge becomes, are the people that we work for equally open? For a lot of traditional leaders, the mentality is, if it ain't broke, why fix it? And the challenge with that statement is it addresses the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. When we talk about change management, it's deliberately not called changing solution. And the reason for that is there isn't always a current compelling reason to change. The reason is all about being prepared. What we're focused on, I told you that we take an AI first approach to all of our development. Mm -hmm. We've recently changed the way we talk externally in the market that Oracle's cloud mantra is that we want to create tomorrow today. And we take that very seriously. It's three very simple words, but it emphasizes the fact that we're in the business of creating and innovating and that everything that we're doing is not for 
what we can give you right this minute, but what we're preparing for the future and make it available to you as fast as possible. The reason that's important is because one of the most fundamental things that's happened in this very disruptive world is we can no longer take for granted traditional definitions of strength. You can be a billion dollar company today and get disrupted and eventually bankrupt tomorrow. You can be a company that's existed in India for a hundred years and get disrupted by three digital players tomorrow. And maybe you have a safety net, maybe it's a family run conglomerate, maybe the government will save you. But the reality is it will be too late. Your best people will have left. So how do we prepare for that today? So to me, change management is convincing senior leaders of the importance of preparing for the future, despite all the traditional safeguards they think exist. And that's very hard to do. Uh, one of the ways a lot of our customers do it is by modeling out what would happen tomorrow if they did nothing. Mm -hmm. What is the cost of doing nothing? Who could potentially disrupt us? Who could potentially take our people? Who could potentially steal our business? And then let's work backwards. Where can we focus? Maybe we start with people. Maybe we start with our attitude. Then we define our mission. Then we establish a success metric. Then we write a plan. Then we invest in what we need to do in order to execute that plan. Very powerful question that you've put, Yazad. What is the cost of doing nothing? I think that's a very, very powerful question. Any inspiring story that you would like to share uh, with us, Yazad? Some of the stories that you've come across. I'm, I'm happy to share our own story because mm -hmm. Let's forget about the product side of it for a second. I joined Oracle two years ago. And one of the reasons I joined was I had a false impression of, of not just Oracle, but large technology companies in general. I'd also, I'd always personally worked in the digital space, uh, lots of companies that ended with .com and had always thought in my head that traditional large tech wasn't for me. And I think for many years I was right, especially about a company like Oracle that 10 years ago hadn't yet invested in cloud. And you know what I found impressive? We have a, we have a very charismatic CEO, like a lot of founders who are still in place. Uh, he's not young. He's one of the richest men in the world. And what is the cost of doing nothing for him 10 years from now? What's the worst case scenario? Maybe the company isn't as large as it was, and maybe he's not as rich as he was, but still worth several billion dollars. Is that a compelling reason for him to act? I don't know. What impressed me is several years ago, he decided to act. And he decided after maybe not acknowledging cloud for what it was, changed his tune completely, has bet the entire company, which was built by the way on physical databases, has bet the entire company on cloud that everything we do from software to infrastructure to platform to database will be available in the cloud. He wants to prepare for tomorrow. He didn't start out thinking that. He was convinced, <clears throat> he was convinced to think that way. And the company is doing very well because of it. I only share this example because it is possible. You can teach an old dog new tricks. I think the challenge for all of us who are not sitting in the C-suite is how do we convince our senior leadership? Or if we are in the C-suite, how do we convince the person at the head of the table? Mm. And that's a big challenge. Change can be intimidating. How do we convince our senior leadership through these types of stories, through modeling and statistics that prove it out where the data doesn't lie? Mm. How do we get people who are entrepreneurial in spirit within our organization to convince those leaders who have always worked in a more traditional sense. So that's, that's Oracle's story. But I also think uh, there's, there's a company that's at the opposite end in terms of size that I don't think any of you have heard of, uh, but I love to tell this story. And it's not a customer of mine. They're a really small business. It's a company in Malaysia that sells stone tiles. And typically just like you would see in the, Stone Tile District of Delhi or Bombay or Bangalore in 
Kuala Lumpur, there's a street where all the stone tile sellers have their shops. And this guy has one goal. He wants to be the best stone tile store in Malaysia. And what he's done is this. He only hires university graduates and he has built a culture of learning in his organization, just a couple hundred employees, by the way, that looks and feels and even tastes like Facebook. Okay. All the normal dot-com accoutrements are there and the bean bags and the foosball tables and all that, the free food, but it's a culture of learning, all available via mobile. And the, the offer is come and work for me and my main goal will be to develop your career. If I help you do that and provide you with personalized learning and development along the way, I don't need to ask you to work your hardest and be your most productive. You will naturally do it, partly because you are excited to do it and well-trained and skilled to do it, and partly because you recognize the unspoken contract. I'm helping you, you're going to help me. And guess what? The number one stone tile seller in Malaysia is Firuni Ceramica. And if you Google that company, half of the links on Google are not about their stone tiles. It's about their learning and development program. That's what they're known for. And anyone who wants to work in retail in Malaysia has this stone tile shop on their list of preferred employers. How do we think different and prepare for the future? Very interesting. That's, that's a very fascinating story. And I'm sure our audience have enjoyed the story. And there is some Google search that's happening parallelly as we speak, <laughs> the benefits of being in a virtual conference. But with that story, Yadar, I can see uh, a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I would like to take a few of them. And sure. uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to couple a few of them together because they probably lie in the bigger umbrella and we'll try and see as much as we answer, as we can answer in the next uh, five to seven minutes that we have at our hand. So this question, Yazad, is really around, uh, there are two, three questions around how technology is, in, uh, you know, the mind, it's impacting the mindset that we are becoming irrelevant. So, for example, the use of chatbots, what's the relevance of HR if we really implement chatbot to the T? So that's one question. And also the other question is using more technology also impacts uh, the relevance of employees at large. So happy to hear your thoughts on how technology is impacting jobs and specifically HR. Chatbots and jobs. Okay. <laughs> Again, let me reference a, a conversation from this morning. It's still fresh mm -hmm. in my head. Uh, Remember the round table I was at? We have the CHRO of a major um, bank sitting next to us. And we have someone who says in the panel discussion, uh, that's a nice talk that all of you gave about progress and automation, AI first, that's fantastic. What does that mean for the employees who get replaced and are jobless? And my response, while I didn't use this term, it's a false equivalence. What I said was, and I confirmed with the, with the woman from the bank, I said, did you fire half of your branch employees 30, 40 years ago when you launched ATMs across the Philippines? No. As we progress in technology, it opens up new avenues. Two things happen. One, we have an opportunity to retool and focus on the strategic work that we should have probably been doing more of that was already in our remit as we move the tactical work away. And two, it creates new opportunities. If I told my father when I was a five-year-old that dad, one day I'm going to work in a digital advertising agency and then pivot into a role uh, working in the cloud, he'd look at me like I had three heads. The last 20 years of my career has been in an industry, in a function, using technology, all three of which didn't exist before 1994. Who's been replaced and, and is jobless because of that? So, yes, there are bumps. If people don't change until the disruption has already occurred all around them, yes, there will be bumps. But your specific question around chatbots, Let's take a very strong example. If I'm an entry-level HR admin named Dennis, which is the real name of the real HR admin who onboarded me at Oracle two years ago, okay? If I'm Dennis, and Dennis is first year or whatever he is, and 
His job is to onboard all the senior level employees. But a part of his job is to answer the phone in the HR department when it rings. Now, if a chat bot replaces, as it should, all the repetitive mundane questions that he gets daily over the phone and email, does he lose his job? Or does he now have an opportunity to do 100% better in onboarding senior people as they join the company, which is also part of his remit? I would suggest that if anything, chatbots, automation, anything repetitive and routine that can be replaced is only going to make us more successful, not replace us. If we are in a low cost labor market, like we are in India, where we have an individual for literally every single action of move, moving something from here to there, what an amazing opportunity to give that person new skills, make them a multi-tool player, respect them with dignity, and give them something more significant to do with their brain and replace their fingers and that one repetitive movement with technology. That makes complete sense to me. I think that is a job that should be replaced. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I think with that, yeah, that you've answered three, four questions that I can see on the list. So I hope uh, folks who ask these questions, you got an answer to the question. Um, the next question that I have for you, Yazad, is from Shalini. And an interesting question. She asks, what amazes you the most today when you talk about employee experiences or employee engagement with the HR leaders across multiple countries? What amazes you? My favorite thing is you know, a large part of my job is, is this type of conversation and I, not all of the ideas I have are my own. I, I'm trying to constantly learn from everything around me and I'm very lucky that, that I get exposed to leaders and, and industries from around the world. I'm always amazed when I learn something new, when the customer I'm speaking to is even more forward thinking than the organization that I represent. When we get challenged so hard that we have to say, wow, you want that today, we are working on it, it's a year away. That's exciting for me. It's exciting for me when we talk to someone who gets it even more than we do, who when I say I'm imagining uh, a world where we don't communicate with our HR system by a keyboard, they say, of course there should be no keyboard, there should be no HR system. How do we get there? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. They're not saying it that way because they think it has no use. They want it to iterate so hard and so fast that it becomes fully integrated into the fabric of all the communications in their company and they no longer think of it as a discrete element. That's exciting to me. It's exciting to me when we start to recognize the ability for us to use all the technology that exists today in the world and apply it today. I'll give you a good example. Imagine if the onboarding experience was that you gave someone a VR headset, first day at work and using that VR headset, they're able to get the tour of the office on their own, or maybe they do it with their onboarding batch. And as they go through, it's like Pokemon Go, and they're getting points for finding where the ladies' room is, finding the canteen, meeting their buddies, right? Imagine if the first day experience felt like you were playing a game, but you actually realize at the end of the day that you just completed a week worth of onboarding because it was so efficient. This gets me excited. Imagine if instead of waiting once a year, or once every six months or once a quarter or once a month to be assessed or evaluated, that it was constant and in the background, that you know immediately where you stand, that if you're a millennial who's only gonna work at a company for 18 months, that you don't have to wait until the 12th month to know how you're doing. Mm. And maybe if the company's able to deliver that to you, that they're able to keep you for 20 months instead of 18, which as a proportion is significant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the sort of thing that gets me excited. Very interesting. Yeah, that I'm just a little conscious of time uh, of yours and everyone who's on the uh, this session as well. We're one minute over the session timing actually. So, but I would request you as to close this session with your closing thoughts on picking up the right HR technology and leading the technology agenda in the organization. For me, it's very simple, and I don't think that uh, anyone listening to this, this uh, conversation now would disagree. The pace of change is inexorable, okay? There will be self-driving cars in Bangalore in the next two years. There are self-driving trains in Delhi now. Mumbai, whose infrastructure we know is not the best in the world, when all the disruption of building that metro is done, 
will have the most modern metro in the world. Paradigms are shifting very rapidly. Expectations are changing very rapidly. If we do not keep up with the times, our people will feel disrespected and they will leave and the best ones will not join us. These, are, these people are 60 to 70% of our hard costs. If we don't respect them now and start preparing for a future where they, they feel good, we are not going to have a business. And you can forget about the employees. So the good news is there's tremendous opportunities available to look into. Of course, there's our own business, but I encourage you to look around, educate yourself on all the technology that's out there. It, I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time to be a leader in human resources. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you so much, Yaza. Thank you. And for all of those who are viewing this session, you can find Yaza's details that has been shared on the screen. So if you want to reach out, if you want to talk to him, uh, you can reach out to him in the conference itself because Yaza will be there in the conference and also. And also you have the details uh, to reach out to him. Thank you so much, Yaza, for such a fascinating conversation and sharing Thank those insights. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this session. And before you uh, log off from this session, let me take this opportunity to share the secret code for the leaderboard contest for this session, which is hashtag tech agenda two. I will just spell it out so that you get it right. It is hashtag T E C H A G E N D A two, the numeral two. So it's tech agenda two. So please go ahead, uh, enter the secret code from Yadad's session and uh, spend the your position on the leaderboard. And now we will break for a networking break and we will be back with the next session on a panel on performance management, cracking the code of performance management. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Yazad. Thank you, Mega. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.